Well, folks, it's Raven, Mahay and I favor nothing missing, nothing broken, nothing absent from your lives that are needed. I am back with another interview, and I have to tell you, this gentleman sent me a copy of his new book. I read it from cover to cover and didn't set it down once. Uh, I consider this gentleman a friend of mine. Um, <laughs> easy conversation, which is hard to find. Glenn, how you doing? Very good. It's a pleasure to be back with you again and to, uh, to interact with your audience. I'll tell you, we've had so many positive comments about our, we've had so many positive comments about our two interviews, and some people were kind of upset that it seemed like our first interview was being suppressed quite a bit, and um, I answered them in the emails, and I said, look, uh, we're not telling the same story everybody else is. <laughs> Do you expect it to be wide open and available? Um, well, there's always a, a certain amount of uh, negative interaction when people you know, uh, find out that um, certain concepts that they have uh, embraced uh, need to be further evaluated uh, for what I call a reality check. And so then they, the first reaction is always to be, uh, you know, uh, a bit obtuse and then and defensive and things like that. And so, you know, it's, uh, it's all things that we work through and uh, we try to point out um, that, um, you know, there is a greater clarity involved. It's not mystical. It's not, um, uh, it's not, uh, you know, some kind of, um, strange sensation. It's just basically the realization of, of facts and truth. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Now folks, his book was phenomenal and we're going to go through bits and pieces of it and, and talk about it. But uh, it's called The UFO Reality, Can Truth Prevail? And uh, uh, what do you think about, I, I, we have to start where we start. What do you think about the progression of ufology? Let's just call it, call it ufology. And the storyline, the narratives from the 50s to today. Well, the reason that I composed this book and I took a good long time doing it because I wanted it to be authentic um, was to provide people with a factual background of really what has happened in the past versus the UFO history that is being misconstrued and reinvented and and, uh, you know, circulated like a washing machine in order to to try to propose a different agenda and a different understanding. So my greatest uh, concern and endeavor was to provide the facts so people could see them for themselves. Most people are so dependent upon Google and the Internet in order to obtain uh, their information. But that is only as good as you know where you're going that you're you know, what you're looking at and where you're going to find that information. And people have either <clears throat> come from later generations that are, are unaware of these things or have come from a time where they uh, remember some of it if they were uh, interested in this field. But then it has faded into the past as well. So the first half of the book is basically a history, an autobiography of our organization, my family's history and myself within this UFO field. You know, we've been in it over half a century. Yeah. And all the activities that we went to, to the NASA, to the Pentagon, to the British House of Lords, all these places that we were invited to. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, these these people are not idiots they don't invite somebody who's going to go give them a story about uh, uh sasquatch you know whether sasquatch <laughs> exists or not as a primate you know there are many species that roam around and we are discovered all the time but that has nothing to do with ufos they're not piloting ufos and coming here and being dropped off that is all nonsense so i tried to deal with the with the reality fact and then the second half of the book the other, what, 12 chapters or so, it's called Reality Check. And it goes into the history all, back, all the way back uh, several thousand years, so historical records of the reports mm -hmm. of UFOs. Then it, uh, another chapter talks about how the, um, the UFO 
history is being um, uh, reinvented and the government's involvement in it and our agency's involvement in trying to to confuse this the issue and uh, and and so many other things uh, the the fallacy about chemtrails uh, the fallacy about we didn't go to the moon which obviously we did anybody who looks at the data and the pictures and the films can tell that for themselves I mean this is not uh, <laughs> pardon the pun it's not rocket science it's, it's pretty plain. <laughs> You know, and well, no. so that's what the book is, is there for, to give people uh, a, a substantial history based on firm footing and facts and documentation, as we discussed before. All the documentation is included. I am not like many people in this field who just throws out accusations and throws out innuendo and has no proof at all to sustain anything they say. They say. I have pro provided all the proof. So people can see it for themselves, and that's that's quite unique in this UFO field. You know, for me, the, folks, I don't normally make notes, <laughs> but now let's start at the start. Confusion factors and hiding history. Um, I would say it's more like confusion factories. We have several alphabet agencies that have been trying to sow confusion since the 1940s. Well, that's true, and that and they have even pr have been in revealed in printing. In fact, you find that in the book as well. They, they uh, you know, in the early fifties, fifty one to fifty three, the Robinson panel, uh, which the intelligence communities uh, stated that we're going to make sure that this is um, uh, intermersed with uh, a reticule factor, and w we have to, in their words, they have to muddy the waters so that people won't pay any attention. And uh, and to try to to make this all into some kind of a, uh, a whimsical circus show, well, which they did. I mean, basically, that's what mm -hmm. it's turned into. But uh, there has been a documented effort by a certain agencies and groups uh, in order to try to dispel anything to, to do with this subject. And that was the phase mm -hmm. one of the program that they initiated, uh, you know, in the late forties and through the fifties and beyond. And that was to, to ignore it, to dispel it, to ridicule it, to make it look ridiculous. And, uh, and then to, uh, intimidate if they thought it was necessary, if the, if the witnesses had too much proof, pictures, photos, too many, uh, uh, additional witnesses on site and what have you, then they would go out and uh, and go out and to discourage the witnesses. And and this is the uh, not only the men in black because that was there. The men in black were nothing more than agents for the intelligence communities that were assigned yes. to go out there and do that. But uh, you know there were many different um, uh, uh, officials that uh, were dressed in black that took uh, part of that as well. You know, in 1963, now I've I've had trouble relocating this footage. Um, I found it, and then I couldn't find it, which I found rather disturbing. But in 1963, they actually made a video where they hired an actor to play a, a podunk, you know, hillbilly type character, and they interviewed him about a UFO he saw, and then they put it on national news. Um, now. I didn't think anything of it to start out with when I first saw the interview. And then I saw the, the byline for this interview and he was an actor from California. They filmed it in California and, uh, they aired it on several news channels in, in areas where there had been sightings, um, as if he was a local. <laughs> well, I remember that in the fifties there was Buck Nelson and he was, uh, he was a farmer. It was somewhere in the Midwest and, and uh, from the contacts that have, I have and have had over the many decades, Buck Nelson's uh, um, uh, incident was authentic. It, it actually happened because these these craft do not discriminate. And that's what bothers our academics so much, because they all believe that if something lands, it should be landing in that backyard because they're, you know, Ph.D. Sue. And so I call it alphabet soup. You yeah. know, and 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 they, sh they, you know, they're supposed to be the smartest man on the planet, and all this other stuff. 
and they cannot stand the thought that this craft would land amongst the general population and choose people to interact with based upon their own uh, vetting and evaluation, which is their mm-hmm. right to do. I mean, let's face it. If you're going to go talk to somebody, you do the same thing. You use your own uh, intelligence to look at the person and interact with the person to decide whether this uh, ty- uh, conversation is even going to be of any uh, value or worth. And so mm-hmm. that drove the academics crazy. And, and then, of course, it drove our military crazy as well because they had no way to deter it because there are no weapons. We have no weapons that can can um, impact them uh, on a long range scale. We have no facilities that can uh, detain them. You know, these, <laughs> I, I have to laugh because I keep seeing these now, these programs about, oh, well, we have extraterrestrials that are sequestered in Area 51, or if it's not 51, we'll invent it and make it 52 or 53. And w- yeah, Right, Patterson? Uh, well, th- there are bodies for <laughs> There were bodies um, uh, from the Roswell era that were at Wright Pat, but uh, several of them were transferred to Bethesda and also uh, to Walter Reed. And mm-hmm. um, and so um, uh, I remember that uh, President Kennedy had uh, had seen uh, 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 examined, uh, seen, reviewed one of some of the bodies there. Uh, I think that uh, after. Kennedy assassination, they were moved off field. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, nobody can say where they've been put at this point. But like I said, again, they have they have understanding and technology that there is no prison, there is no lock, there is no magnetic field, there is no technology that we have. I mean, our technology is caveman compared to theirs. And there is mm-hmm. nothing that we can do to hold them against their wills. So whenever I hear stories like that, I have to literally laugh because it is so contrary to the truth. And people think, oh, well, you know, we'll just put them in a in a cage like an animal. I mean, that that's nothing to them. They walk right out. And so (coughs) I I, I'm always looking up old stuff and and. In uh, 1974, out in Nevada, they picked up somebody walking down the road who seemed to be disorientated. Didn't know what else to do with him, so they took him to the jail and put him in jail. And they were trying to make inquiries as to who it was and, and make reports and whatever. You know, Back then, it wasn't the same as it is today where you have instant connections to everybody. And uh, they turned around, and the person was no longer there, and they could see him walking down the street, and then he was gone. And I always thought that after you and I talked, I always thought about that incident as being very interesting because, first of all, it was in Nevada. And the second thing is, is he just kind of walked out of a a locked, secure jail, passed all the people, and then was seen outside and then vanished. And I thought, hmm, (laughs) but he just looked like one of us. Yeah, exactly. Just like one of us, just with superior skills. And uh, and, uh, it it would be no different that if we go and – and uh, go and decide to visit the tribes in the Amazon, and and we go there, and we come in boats and airplanes. Uh, they look at us like we are, you know, people like them. We don't look much different, other than, you know, other than paper skin tone, perhaps, or what have you. But uh, they look at us at, at, as advanced individuals due to the technology that we have developed. And while we have developed uh, greatly scientifically. We have miserably failed in the sociological and, as we had talked earlier, the perpetuation of wars and arms deals and, and, and uh, uh, black ops um, uh, manipulations and things like that around the world uh, is, is, is still something we love to play in. So we're mm-hmm. still infants and in, in, in moronic when it comes to that. We you know... The hiding of the history, you know, uh, folks like folks like George Adamski, for example, with his photographs and experiences. But there are many around the world from that era that have completely been buried in, uh, underneath and, and way off into the back cabinets um, under this new ufology that they're doing. Um, why well, do you think that they're they, so adamant about this? They want you to accept their substitutions because during that era 
whether you have, I believe that in the book, and I, I'd have to look for the page, uh, there's the picture from Brazil in which the Brazilian Navy photographer on board the cruiser took several pictures, and they mm -hmm. are, 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 are wonderful. I mean, there's no question as their authenticity. The American government tried desperately to uh, poo-hoo the entire thing and tried to accuse the Brazilians of of inadequacies and, and all this other stuff. And they got very upset about it. They said, listen, there it was. We pointed the camera, took the picture. How much more do you need to know? And, mm -hmm. um, and so when you, when you go back and you'll see some of the pictures in the book from, um, uh, the one of the cigar shaped ship, um, over yes. uh, Alamogordo Holloman air force base. Uh, that's just a still, I believe that's actually a mo motion picture footage because it moves <coughs> across the screen. Uh, bless you. So and, that, uh, <laughs> no worries. <laughs> and, uh, and so there's New Jersey footage. There's my God, when you pull, when you start pulling out all the actual photos, the real stuff, mm -hmm. then, then, you can only shake your head when somebody like uh, a couple of days ago, the Pentagon announced that their investigation into the Navy's uh, video was, was uh, there was nothing to investigate it. Once again, mm -hmm. we go back to the, to the uh, era of silence and denial. And, um, and so, but what has happened recently is that we have built our own crafts. We, and they are either triangular shaped, cubes, uh, a craft with protrusions and landing gears and, and all this other stuff. This is, and 60% of the sightings now are our own research and development. And yes. they, and, and they want to push that so that people never see the same kind of images twice in reality. So they become more and more confused. And, uh, and, and in the meantime, we continue to experiment with our own uh, type of propulsions and, and type of uh, 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 hull formats and things like that. But none of that's real. That's all stuff that can only operate within the atmosphere at a reduced way, rate. It cannot go into space. It cannot travel between planets. And, um, and so, you know, once again, adding to the confusion factor as much as yes. possible. Uh, because they believe that the longer they can keep it confused, the less that they will be put on the spot to have to, to give you any information. And while there is a contingent in this UFO field that keeps promising disclosure, as I said in one of my chapters, disclosure is an illusion, a yes. sucker's bet, as they call it in Las Vegas, because they will <laughs> never, they will never release the truth about what they found and, and, and what they've benefited from. And um, the technology that they have recovered and, and reverse engineered, and they will never admit any of those things because uh, then that would be admitting to greater intelligence beyond our planet and greater capabilities. And they want the majority of the people to be placated and pacified uh, with oh, what, yes. what they've got and, and how things are being done now. Well, you know, I found it interesting when I read that part in the book. I'm like, now. Is he is he pre guessing or, or is he is he uh you know it's a pattern of behavior so it's 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 you can see that they've done this several times in different kinds of hearings but when I read that in the book I'm like man if somebody realized that this was in this book already and then I was waiting for the I, I hadn't seen the trial thing yet I was I've been busy for the last few days but folks they literally said that there's nothing to see here just like they have over time the disclosure is over um, and. And Glenn, having seen the pattern over the years, made sure that that was in his book. I want to point that out to you all. So Be we're not talking about somebody that has no experience. Glenn and his father and George had all experienced this through the years. Well, and all you have to do is to type up, uh, just go and search congressional hearings of the 1960s. And yes. you will see that. You had a number of congressmen and senators. In fact, this McCormick, Speaker of the House, Barry Goldwater, who was a a, uh, a retired general who denied yes. access to the information. This is whole plethora of people that Jerry, uh, Gerald Ford and I mean, a, a list and list. And, and there were congressional hearings held in the 
60s as well, late 60s as well, along with um, the topic of academics such as Professor McDonald and, and so many others that, uh, that oh, yeah. pushed hard for the release of information. And as Mr. Donald Rumsfeld said during that time, you don't deserve to know. And so, <laughs> and so consequently, this is just a replay. Basically, it's oh, yeah. like watching Monday Night Football. It's time for the replay <laughs> section, you know, and, mm. and they keep doing that because they know that all they have to do is, is readapt the information and uh, let it out piecemeal over a period of time. And then uh, people will think it's either something new or they will think that something's being done. For instance, mm -hmm. in 1971, uh, it was released that the, the, the equipment from Apollo registered lunar geysers, moon geysers, spraying from, for 7 to 14 hours. So we knew mm -hmm. that there was water on the moon already in 1971. Yet they make mm -hmm. such a big deal in that in 1990, almost 30, 40 years later. Oh, look, water on the moon. Well, all they're doing is feeding you the stuff they already once told you and figured that one generation had forgotten and the other one was just so disinterested uh, that they wouldn't look for it themselves. And so um, that is in Chapter 5 of the second half of the book, addressing the entire loon and moon issue and uh, all those mm -hmm. who try to convince you that uh, we didn't go to the moon, which is absolute nonsense. I mean, all you had to do is look at the, look at all the, the, the rockets launched from Cape Canaveral or Cape Kennedy. And uh, I mean, it, for all the thousands of people who saw a Saturn V lift off, you could hear the roar all the way across the state. I yep. mean, and, and then they tracked it with telescopes all the way to the moon. The LROC missions that orbited the moon later took photographs of the remaining equipment, the base of the lunar module and all the equipment, including the lunar rover for later missions, sitting in the, in, on the surface of the moon on the landing sites. I mean, when you start collecting all that stuff, uh, you know, this, 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 <laughs> this <laughs> hyperbole that, you know, uh, that the Stanley Kubrick thought he could fake it, which he never said he could. He thought that, that some of it could be reproduced, but he never made the statement. In his own words, he said that. I never made the statement that, that there was any uh, uh, fakery in, in the lunar missions and things like that. This is, and this is, just, this is just sensationalism that is, uh, that is exploited by f a few in order mm -hmm. to, um, to once again, uh, whip up the public's agenda. They, they show you recently, they showed you the footprints of um, Armstrong on the moon, and they show you the pattern in his boot. And then they show you a picture of another set of boots sitting somewhere else. Uh, they don't disclose that where, that has a different pattern on it. Well, I mean, it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that your EVA suit or your space suit is of different construct than the suit and the equipment and the shoes and the gloves and everything that you wear while you're on board the LEM or the command module. You're not sitting there in your space suit for a week. You know, yeah. it, it just takes a little logical thinking, people. Come on. I mean, this 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 is not outside the realm of of anyone's ability to take a look at them and say, say, hey, come on now. <laughs> now, one other thing that you addressed in this book, and, and we'll probably talk about a lot of stuff, but at this point, Chimera. <laughs> um, you know, people talk about seeing these weird things that are like part human, part whatever, part human, part this, and, and uh, I have talked to various people and they say, well, that's, you know, that's part of experimentation that's being done by different groups within our own population. Um, but people want to insist and tell me that the Mantis men are aliens. No, no. If, you, if anybody knows anything about biochemistry or organic chemistry, you look at the biochemical lab in Maryland and the director, which was uh, Cyrus uh, uh, Panampura, he wrote a book called, uh, the, I believe it's The Principles of Life, and mm -hmm. he discusses 
how the elements and the chemicals come together. And we just there's a standard predetermined parameter and principles upon how creation comes together, the organic chemistry, the amino acids, as how life is produced. No, no mantis, no reptilian. Uh, <laughs> these things don't just crawl out of, the, out of the ocean or the jungle and start building microchips and computers and understand, mm. they don't even have the cranial capacity to understand a high scientific uh, equations and values and and the, the sheer, it shows such ignorance on the part of people that they, because they don't understand the sheer unbelievable technology that is required to travel between the planets and the stars. You know, to think that your gopher is going to uh, crawl out of his cage and start building a 747s, you know, is just ludicrous. And, <laughs> what, and, and they have very cl clearly stated that there are no species coming to visit us. That is a star room's bar room scene. And everybody mm -hmm. wants that. Yeah, I want to, they relate to Star Wars or Star Trek or Alien or Predator or God knows all these movies, Armageddon and uh, all of this. And, and they want to believe that anything that comes from space has to be horrific and monstrous. And oh, that yeah. is absolute nonsense. There are four types, human, humanoid, android, and robotics. There are no species coming through space. There are races. And I know mm -hmm. this gives people an unbelievable heartache because mm -hmm. they want so desperately to believe the Star Wars bar scene. Mm -hmm. and, and it's just not true. It, it's it's yeah. that simple. And any of you real scientists will tell you that true. I had, uh, uh, as I described in the book, we had a symposium in the Southwest, a number of highly, um, highly credited and uh, uh, noteworthy scientists over a period of three days. And uh, the leader of that uh, group, who's uh, still alive, um, he, we sat at, at his home after we had this, um, meeting in his house and he had his friends and scientific uh, partners, people all over because he worked and had worked in the local laboratories. And he said, you know, people are so ignorant of the truth. They have no idea what the development of the human form is and what's the difference between that and the species that come from other environments. You know, the, the whale mm -hmm. or the dolphin might be the smartest animal in its environment, the ocean, but it's still limited to the ocean. And the idea mm -hmm. is that we are the only creation that transcends all of those environments and have the ability to understand and, and visit and incorporate all the environments within our understanding. So I'm, mm -hmm. you know, whether people like it or not, that is the reality of it. <laughs> when I hear stories of these creature features, I can already not waste my time with it. I go on to more important uh, information and data. Nice, nice. Now, something else I wanted to bring up while I had you on with me is the Tau SETI signal. That's true. There was um, already in the 60s, there was um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the radio telescope in Puerto Rico in Arecibo, which is now been decommissioned and destroyed. I guess they're going to build another one. Um, the environment down there in the tropics perhaps was not the <laughs> the wisest place to do that because things corroded and deteriorated faster. But anyway, they received uh, signals from space that were absolutely positively intelligent oriented. They were not mm -hmm. pulsars. They were not... Um, other type of natural phenomena, and uh, of course the Tau Ceti signals and the other signals. Uh, uh, it's funny because the radio astronomers keep um, pushing the Ceti program, in which we will point into deep space and deep space uh, further. And every time they get some kind of a response, they decide to swivel their equipment and look somewhere else because yes. they don't they don't want to have to deal with what they've actually come across. 
And mm-hmm. so, um, you know, it's it's another one of those things where uh, the reality of the information is is put on a side shelf uh, till what place and time they determine they may or may not divulge it. Uh, once again, they mm-hmm. they are deciding what they feel is best for us, and we don't get a say in the matter. Well, you know, one of the things that I have been thinking about since our first conversations, and and more so since reading the book, is in order to admit that we have visitors from other places that look like us, they would have to. I'm trying to figure out a good way to word this. It would create a whole new universe for the people here on this planet. And well, I'm afraid, I, I think the people who are in control um, really don't want that to happen. As I had mentioned to you earlier, one of the scientists, uh, uh, when my father and mother were invited to the panels, he asked uh, my father, he says, how many human beings from other worlds do you feel are here amongst us? My father wrote down a number on a piece of paper. The scientists wrote down his number. They exchanged pieces of paper and they had basically the same number. So mm-hmm. it was not it was not that they didn't know. Uh, they know that we have visitors from other worlds that walks amongst us. And mm-hmm. they know that they come here to help us uh, and 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 try to prevent us from from destroying ourselves. And as I say in the book, uh, they have uh, uh, intervened in two perpetual uh, uh, opportunities to have nuclear war. And the interesting thing is, uh, not too long ago, which I included also in the book, last year, uh, Edgar Mitchell, astronaut Edgar Mitchell, I believe was Apollo 17, made the same statement that uh, that the space visitors had uh, had uh, intervened in two uh, situations that would have uh, escalated into atomic destruction. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, uh, people want to complain, well, why don't they do more for us? Well, I mean, when they prevent you from killing all of yourselves on the planet, that's a pretty big deal in my book. And when they go to governments and give them information, it is not their fault that the governments decide not to pass that information on to the general public. It is not their fault that the religious organizations also, who have been contacted and given proof, have chosen to ignore that as well, because the religious organizations are just as political as any as the government agencies, and it's all about power, money, numbers, and income for them. Yes. And and so... Um, you know, they, they, they do the best they can, and, and people say, well, why don't they just mass land, you know, flood our skies? Well, we've already, we've already exhibited the type of behavior we have, whether it was the War of the Worlds broadcast during Orson Welles' time, uh, there was the Alternative 3 broadcast in the UK that caused the same hysteria in the yes. 70s. Yes. Um, uh, you know, people say, they tell me all the time, and they say, well, we're ready. And as I said in the book, I said, are you really? Because I doubt that their people are really ready. Because nah. the, change, the change that these visitors, just one item, electromagnetic free energy, your planet produces it by the tune of trillions and trillions of volts, very much like a Van de Graaff generator or the or the Tesla coils, you know, uh, which exhibited all that electrical static energy uh, flowing like lightning bolts to the globe, and then he can mm-hmm. go inside and stand inside and have no harm to his body. Just one of their everyday technologies would change the entire surface of this planet. We would not have any more need for petroleum, which means that all the, the uh, down trickle-down industries and rubber and that use oil and and tires. I mean, everything. Auto mm-hmm. industry, everything. All the things would change because we would no longer be able to charge for it. And we would mm-hmm. not be able to differentiate status of people because of what car and how much they spend on it and, and who they think they are. 
because none of that would make any difference anymore. That alone would change the entire economy of this planet. And, and we don't want any of that. And most well. people, most people don't, don't think further than that because when it impacts themselves, then they start to shake their heads. When the stock market no longer is functioning and their retirements are in jeopardy and 401ks, when the, when the whole economical status of the world goes into a complete revolutionary change, it mm-hmm. impacts every citizen on the planet. And people like everybody else to suffer the consequences, not themselves. So yes. I often tell people, I said, I really don't think that you are, are prepared for these changes. And they, I would don't, take like, it in they don't like to hear that. <laughs> you know, I always, talk, I always talk about the system that we live within right now is an artifice based on financial classes. Um, personally, I, w- I would embrace it in a heartbeat. Most of the people around me would would think it was just horrible, <laughs> but uh, I, they don't have forward thinking. You well, know, because the whole emphasis. Look at the emphasis in 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 ex, in your lives and existence. It is to you know grow up, get a high high value education so that you can get a high paying job so that you can afford the best of of, uh, creature comforts and homes and prestigious neighborhoods, drive the expensive cars, and so on and so forth. The entire emphasis, they have convinced people that economic slavery, and that's what it is because your whole Mm -hmm. life you chase it after that, and it's never enough and it's never good enough because once you've got one, they tell you, oh, well, that's that's obsolete now. It's like an iPhone. Every eight months, you got to spend another... $1,200 Twelve hundred dollars for the, <laughs> for the stupid phone, and yeah. people are running and standing in line in order to get it. And so, they are um, the. If you would take away that emphasis of just economic um, perpetuates status. status and perpetuates, people wouldn't know what to do with themselves because now you're told. Now you would be told, well. You have certain talents that you are born with, and if you pursue those talents, you can become, you know, a concert pianist, a fine artist. You can do this. You can do that. None of those things are based upon economic return. People Mm -hmm. wouldn't need to do because they are driven by the thoughts of competition and ambition. And uh, I'm afraid we're not ready. We are not ready as a civilization. No, there are individuals who are ready. But as a civilization, we are not ready. Yeah, I, I told a friend of mine the other day, I said, we know I'm going to be talking to Glenn again. And I said, man, I wish they I wish they would come and get me and my family. I would love to go to another planet and do some woodworking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, because, yeah, I can, because I can not, contribute. Yeah, because everybody contributes based upon their talent and they are not raised with the thought that, you know, uh, you can just be a lazy bum and do nothing and still have all the benefits of the society that is that is is totally contrary to their thinking they are raised the thought is that that everybody contributes and because everybody contributes everybody benefits and we call mm-hmm. that communism but that doesn't exist on this planet in reality because we have social economic communism whether it's mm-hmm. china or russia or anywhere else there is no such thing as true communism and uh, and most people would be wouldn't know what to do with themselves. You know, for me, it's like, you know, if somebody who had musical talent was able to perform music to me, that is a contribution way beyond most of the things that we see today. <laughs> well, yeah, that's it. And, and we really don't we don't understand. We don't promote the talents within our children. And we don't, well, first of all, we don't recognize it as parents often because uh, we ourselves are unfamiliar with it. But if we do recognize it, then, then, uh, um, you know, then it gets promoted, hopefully based upon one's ability to support it. Because once again, it goes back to the same formula. Well, you know, that talent is fine and dandy, but that's not going to put food on the table, as they always said in the old days. That's that's awful, isn't it? Yeah. Awesome. So, so what we do is we, we relegate a population 
to economic slavery. Mm -hmm. Now, next thing. All the documentation and photographs in this book were just fantastic. Um, a lot of folks will put out a book and they'll write this down and, and they, they don't support it with anything. Um, I have to point out, folks, you all listening to us, this book is literally from cover to cover, documented letters from individuals, recognition. Uh, you, <laughs> there's more stuff in here than you could imagine as far as documents and proof of statements, um, which is something that most of you listening to me, if you've read any books lately, probably haven't seen. Glenn, can you point out some of the really good ones? Like I, I saw a couple of them from from uh, um, the military, and I saw a couple of them from NASA. Yeah, what I did is I included um, I included the newspaper article of our uh, of the sighting in 1963 over downtown Washington D.C. That's on mm -hmm. page 27, and um, to show people that it was in the news, and there were other witnesses involved. And also the fact that the um, that the government agencies got involved in order to try to distort the information because everybody witnessed the craft. It was about 1,200 feet above the city, and the mm -hmm. newspaper article then published 12,000 feet, which is 10 times higher. Uh, upon the contacting the editor, he was told by the national from national security reasons they had been contacted and instructed by the government agency to make this alteration. To desensitize uh -huh. the siding so as to not to create the perception that our military was incapable of securing our skies, especially over the nation's capital. But <laughs> the other documentation in here, um, ha, you know, there's some here from Uthant, who was the Secretary General of the United Nations. The UFO yes. situation was very predominant on his mind, and he offered George Damsky a seat on the United Nations in January of 1965. And George mm -hmm. turned it down because he didn't want to be beholden to official agencies for what he could and couldn't say. Yes. And so, but other articles in here have to do with the letters of invitation we received mm -hmm. from uh, Goddard Space Flight Center from Dr. Lohman and 22 scientists panel, which we went and showed um, our uh, UFO films, not only the ones that my father took over Europe in 66, uh, of which there are frames in here as well, uh, but also the George Damsky films. They were all uh, familiar with them. They knew them already, and they mm -hmm. knew all about them, propulsion and where they came from and what have you. Um, well, now, on, on the panel, on the panel, after you guys finished your presentation, <laughs> were there any comments made by these individuals? Well, there was some, there were some talk between... Um, between each themselves and also between my parents, uh, uh, my father did not divulge everything. Uh, mm -hmm. He felt that um, he said what was necessary to say to to make the incident uh, noteworthy. But he mm -hmm. also was very respectful of um, of people's uh, reputations and people's desire to get information out and not. Uh, cause a a issue to themselves personally, and and uh -huh. and so basically he was always very cognizant of interacting with these people on a one to one basis, and and not be out there slinging around, and that's what happens in this in this field of late. Everybody is yes. so anxious to try to get notoriety that anybody who comes forward to talk their name is automatically slung around and thrown under the bus yes. in order to give that person notoriety. And we, mm -hmm. we never operated like that ever because we, we were very respectful of their reputations and what they were trying to do. A lot of information comes out, um, what is the best word to use? Not secretly, but it comes out sort of on the slide so that it is out there for the people who recognize it, but it's not presented at a big giant news conference so everybody can can dwell upon it. Because the first thing you get is you get attacks from the other side, and all it oh, all yes. it turns out to be 
is a knockdown drag out fight and no longer is about the information that was released and the and the reasons behind that and i love that quote from the from the oliver stone movie jfk in which he one of the intelligence operatives are saying we know the when we know the how but what about the why mm -hmm. that is the most important and it is true why are they here um, that's from my father's first book in 1969 that was the title why are they here spaceships from other worlds and and what is the message they bring us and how do they interact with us and what benefits do we derive from that and so on and so forth that is what is trying to be misdirected because yes. if you're constantly arguing about the what and the when you never get to the why and that's mm -hmm. what we're constantly doing this new change in term from ufo to uap is nothing more than a misdirect they know yes. that for the last 50, 60 years or more, that UFO, even though it stands technically for unidentified flying object, has become equated to uh, flying saucers, extraterrestrial spacecraft, these types of things. Yes. And so in order to try to redirect the new generations, they are now trying to push UAP. This is nothing more than the playing of semantics. To once yes. more throw another confusion factor into mm -hmm. there. So yes, there were some private conversations, and there are some uh, conversations that I've had as well, and uh, and those remain, um, you know, private. That's that confidential, that's absolutely. Well, confidential or private, and at which time I, they or I decide con con collectively otherwise. That's how it's going to be because fantastic. You know fantastic. that's. We have to protect people as well because they, they risk a lot by coming forth and giving us information. Well, you know, there have been some slow leaks over, you know, over my timeline from the 80s to today. There have been some so, slow leaks <coughs> that are off the main channel, that are off the main beaten paths. And I always pay attention to the ones that just kind of, kind of come out of nowhere where very quietly. Because they tend to be information that's contradictory to what the main line is trying to present. Um, yeah, and I yeah. don't, I don't, I don't know if that goes back to our generation and the older ones that have been around longer, or if it's just there's information available and somebody's trying to slowly leak it out. Well, I, I will say this: we come from generations where. A lot of things happened, and we were taught to look behind things. For instance, yes. for instance, few people know that the precursor to D-Day was run, the, the experimental phase of it, or the simulation phase, was executed on the eastern shores of Britain, of the United Kingdom, before D-Day. And live ammunition was used. You can look this up for yourself. And mm -hmm. there was large numbers of fatalities of our soldiers that were just written off to the later invasion of, of Europe in D-Day. And nobody yes. was the wiser. And this is something exactly. that has come out in recent years, too. So I think that um, to some degree, uh, generations before us were taught, I know well that my father taught me always look behind things. Never yes. take it as face value and look on what is being done, who has to gain, where is the, the true direction leaning. And we discussed this earlier too in our, uh, our own private conversation about the circumstances in the world today and in the Middle East. And so yes. all of all, that type of, of, of analytical thinking is not something that is proposed much anymore. I mean, you hardly get oh, any interaction between parents and children because we mm -hmm. live in a, 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 like I said before, <laughs> you know, a, a, a economy of slavery, which both parents have to work hard to sustain their children and their families. There is little, very little 
time like we used to have in the past where we would sit down at a dinner table together in the evening, have dinner together as a family and discuss events and discuss mm -hmm. perceptions. And, and there is so little communication anymore between mm -hmm. not only each other, but our children and everything else. And so we have, we have to my uh, opinion, detrimentally given this authority over to the school system our, uh, and uh, our so-called babysitters, because that's what they're there to a greater extent to, and people drop off their kids, not to educate them, but to get rid of them for a certain amount of the day. And so they can go to work and do other things. Uh, we have given this away to our officials. We, we basically have passed the buck, so to speak. And no one is, they're either too tired, overworked, stressed, or sleep deprived. Uh, that that they, don't, they don't look deeper into anything anymore. And when we don't do that, we're in grave danger. Take nothing at face value. No, absolutely, absolutely not. nothing. Well, now, one more point that I wanted to come up on, and, and I just found it fascinating because I've come across this name numerous times. And uh, you're probably going to smile the minute I say this. Major Donald Kehoe. Already <laughs> smiling because, I, of course, Major Kehoe was a well-known figure uh, who wrote many books, Aliens from Space. Uh, I think he wrote probably, you know, four or five books. He was the proponent uh, for NICAP, which was one of the earliest organizations to collect UFO reports. Basically, as we know, as we've listened, listed before, there are a dozen or more uh, official uh, report um, agencies. So we had, yes. pro uh, we had Project Magnet, Project... Uh, my God, I can't even think of a blue book. Uh, uh, the report on unidentified flying objects by Captain Rupold, who received so mm -hmm. much pressure from the military that he was forced to um, to deny all the material that he put out. But he didn't. But that was just to agree with the the the, the official sector. But privately, he never rescinded yes. any of that. Uh, so when you look at all these reports, these are official reports, but NICAP was a private agency, and uh, Admiral Hillencotter, who was actually the first director of the CIA, was also uh, involved with that. And NICAP co collected about 12,000 reports of UFOs, and they were the direct uh, sponsors for the political uh, agenda that I mentioned earlier, uh, the push in the 60s to try to get this to come out publicly. They were the ones who, uh, who were trying to apply the pressure to the U.S. government to pressure their own uh, military and intelligence organizations uh, because the UFOs uh, went from the Air Force jurisdiction to the CIA jurisdiction. But in reality, every armed service uh, branch has its own investigation uh, of, uh, agency in collection of data. And so their 12,000 reports, even if you take the percentage that, that we admitted to, they said, you know, close to 1,000 of them were unexplainable by any standard that any scientific body or any authoritative body could explain them. And so that's still quite a number when you think about it. And so Major Kehoe was behind that. And he tried to go on the air many times, and there's a very famous um, um, a clip of him where he was scheduled to go in the air, and then somebody stepped in and, and redirected the entire program. And so you could see that he was being heavily pursued and heavily censored. And so, um, you know, he's, he's a well-known figure in this particular field, and uh, Colonel Freeman who we saw at the Pentagon in 66, and uh, he was also a friend of Major Kehoe's and Captain Rupold's, and he was very uh, uh, concerned about this information not being given to the public because there was already the flap over the 52, 
in, in July of 52, they flew in formation over the nation's capital. I mean, people say, how come we didn't see them, you know, over our nation's capitals and over our major city? And yet there's a chapter in the book that deals specifically that, that even includes the pictures flying over the nation's capital, our military jets chasing them, the denial phase of the military spokesman, but yet the people behind them, whether it was uh, General, uh, oh, I can't even remember his name, it's not Ramey because Ramey was with Roswell, but uh, a well-known general who was the spokesman who came on the air, but they were still Major Burkow, Colonel Freeman, Captain Rufo, there were still a number of people who did not agree with this silent uh, secrecy agenda, and Colonel Freeman was one of them, and that he was the one we saw at the Pentagon in 66. Yeah. So all of these had, um, had history. Uh, few people know that the, that the waves of UFOs reported over the UK in 53 and 54, the fact that they flew yes. for seven days over the Vatican, and we have the picture uh -huh. in the book, with different formations flying for seven continual days over the Vatican and people taking pictures of them. Uh, three days, three days over Moscow. Three days over, I mean, my God, over, over every major city, <laughs> every major capital, over practically every country. If people would realize how much they have come and tested the parameters of what we will accept and how we will react. They've done mm -hmm. all those things for us, and yet we're still yes. not satisfied. Well, you know, that's uh. just how it goes. <laughs> well, I just thought I'd mention 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 Major Keogh because that was like, uh, to me, that just made me smile when I saw him in the book. Um, and folks, he did write he did write what several books by the time Three he got four, done. I think it? four or five of them. I got them on my shelf yeah. here. Yeah, I think it's I think it's four or five that he wrote. Um, now, that being said, folks, I have kept Glenn with me for uh, almost two hours at this point because we talked before we started recording, as, as I always do. Glenn, let them know the title of the book and where to find it, and I'll make sure the links are in here, folks. And I'll make sure I send you uh, the links, too, because um, Blurp.com is the publisher, B-L-U-R-B.com. It's not necessarily a, a very easy um, – um, uh, uh, website to navigate. So uh, basically, if you go in there into the search engine and type the UFO reality, then it'll take you to the page where the book is available in soft and hard cover. They are nice. They are running. Uh, they run the show as far as the book's concerned. They set the price. They take the order. They print each copy to order. So you are getting a first generation clear off the press copy that's why the pictures are so clear the documents are so clear that you can read the documents the letters that Absolutely. are in there and um and it's available through them so if you're interested uh they are the only ones right now that are uh, responsible for uh, making the book available that may change in the future but not it's not available on amazon because they want a 55 percent cut and uh wow. and the publisher uh, uh, was not willing <laughs> to do that. No, I'm no. Fortunately, I'm out of the loop and all of that. I just had the work of writing and composing the book, and uh, <laughs> they take care of the rest of it. So, now, uh, folks, what I will do, what I will do is I'll go online and I will get you the direct link to the page with the book on it, and that'll be in the description. So, folks. I have had the pleasure of spending another hour and a half, almost two hours with Glenn tonight. Glenn, any final thoughts for folks? Yeah. Yeah. I think that it, like I said before, the purpose of this book is to provide a platform that is uncommon to a greater extent uh, within this field. Now, uh, major mm -hmm. Kehoe wrote a, uh, 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 books that were factual based. There were a number of other authors. George Adamski put all his facts together and his documentation and photographs, unparalleled photographs. And no matter yes. what anybody tells you, you will find all kinds of negative information about George Adamski and all these claims, but none of them provide one ounce of proof. 
Yet on our website, we on our website we provide all the technical examinations uh, per decade of the examination of the Adamski photographs and films, and they have passed all the laboratory, all the expert tests. This is stuff that they don't tell you on the negative side of the internet because they want you to have a biased view of somebody. Because like I said in the book, the UFO community is scared to death of George Adamski. There's no one that they fight more arduously because they (laughs) know that it brings to question all the absurd claims that are being made out there today. And the fact that intelligent human beings come from outer space is something that we want to deny as much as possible. We'll admit to any monster that you want to to put the compo- compose in your fantasy, but we will mm-hmm. not admit to human beings. And, and uh, that's a shame. So I suggest that people um, take a good hard look. That's the reason I wrote the book to give you the facts and the documentation yes. behind everything so that you can see for yourself what existed and not just the innuendos being thrown around there in today's UFO community. Absolutely. Now, folks, Glenn's wrote this book. It's fantastic. George's books, George Adamski's books are available from the Adamski Foundation site. I'll make sure that link's, link is also in here. But I also want to point out to you that that Glenn did an amazing uh, presentation with somebody who actually looked at the. And I, I'm trying to remember his name. Glenn, don't get mad at me. But it's on Glenn's YouTube channel. Oh yeah, um, Renee, Renee Olson. Renee. We did, yeah, we did the we did the. Renee is a photographic expert. He wrote uh, years ago. I gave him access to the original negatives and films from George Adamski and he did a pixel examination and they found even more evidence by doing modern technology examination. Some of those pictures are in the book as well. And uh, he he wrote his own book, The George Adamski Story. Uh, That is also on blurb.com, his book there. He's written some other books as well as that. And um, and that um, that uh, YouTube uh, video you can see the crafts that Adamski filmed maneuvering at high speed, coming to a dead stop, changing directions. Uh, yes. uh, uh, I mean, truly, there is, as, as they said, Colonel Freeman said in the Pentagon, these are some of the best photographs and materials he's ever seen in civilian hands. That's the Folks, key phrase, I, civilian. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Folks, I wanted to point out that Glenn has that video up on his YouTube channel, and I'll put a link in there. It's him and Renee Olson. Renee, forgive me. <laughs> um, it's a fantastic presentation, and, and if you all have a chance, you should go have a look at it. And by all means, I really enjoyed this book. I do not pick many books up and read them cover to cover. Uh, I highly recommend this book. And like I said, the link directly to the book on blurb.com will be in the description. Glenn, thank you for your time and thank you for sharing your, basically your life with us. It's, it, I appreciate this. Well, that's, it's my pleasure. I, it was a story that needed to be told and I think a story that needs to be read. Absolutely. Absolutely. Folks, thank you for joining us. I wouldn't do these interviews if you weren't. That with that being said, I'm gonna hit stop, y'all. Catch me again on the backside, and like I said, check out Glenn's presentation with Renee Olson on YouTube. You'll love it. Have a good night, everyone.